we started this chapter looking at how light rays or any kind of waves when they encounter obstacles will experience diffraction. We looked at it using Huygens principle and I Try to keep it simple to start with by just looking at the simplest case of diffraction and the interference pattern that is caused when a wave goes through two slits, the dual slit experiment. That's the simplest case we could think of. And what you found is that if the light rays start out at a single wavelength and they start out in phase, so there's a single source of light, and then it goes through two different slits simultaneously will get an alternating pattern of constructive and destructive interference as the light emerges some distance behind those two slits. Got a little more complicated, not too much more complicated, by adding a whole series of little slits which is called a diffraction grating. It's designed to sort out different orders, different values of m for different wavelengths. But it's a little more complicated than that. I'm going to give you a situation now, which I think will surprise you, which is too complicated, really, to do the simple arithmetic that we we're able to do for a dual slit. And I'm going to skip the mathematics, but still, you have to know the, the result of this. Let's look back at a single slit now. Just one slit, and now I'm going to define the width of that slit to be A not two slits, just one slit. What happens when waves, particularly light, passes through that slit and then is projected behind it some distance away onto a screen? If light were just a series of bullets, discrete particles, like you shoot, shooting out of a machine gun, you might naively expect that the light that will be lit up on the screen back here is just a direct image of a sort of a duplicate copy of the slit itself. Just a lit up rectangle there and darkness all around. You might have been thinking that, but you might have also thought that before. Did you make that mistake before? It's an intuitive mistake. You were basically implicitly assuming that the wavelength of light was so small that it didn't matter in which case it'd be right. Remember before we had two slits and our intuition said well they're just going to be two bright rectangles on the screen back here but that's not at all what turned out. We saw a pattern of alternating constructive and destructive interference caused by the diffraction. Now I'm telling you something much weirder that I think a lot of you are going to have to puzzle over for a bit but I'll try to explain it. That's not the pattern you see the light coming through a single slit of width A, and I'm taking a case here where A might not be that much larger than the wavelength of the light. So a pretty narrow slit here. Then, lo and behold, oh my gosh, you get another interference pattern projected on the screen back here. An alternating series of bright areas where obviously the light rays went through there and constructively interfered, and then especially these dark bands where there's basically no light because different parts of the light that went through the slit here somehow got 180 degrees out of phase, half a wavelength out of phase, or three halves of wavelength out of phase, or five halves of wavelength out of phase, and they canceled each other out. They destructively interfered with each other leaving this pattern here. Whoa! Does that seem mysterious? Let's see if we can demystify it a little bit. I'm not gonna do the mathematics on this, which requires, unfortunately, analyzing this rectangular slit here as a series of different sine waves. That's actually the principle of Fourier analysis. So that's a uh, actually a bit more advanced than freshman calculus, for example, which is all that we're assuming in this course, if even that. So I'm not going to do the derivation, but I'll give you a qualitative derivation, so at least you'll understand where this weird diffraction interference phenomenon comes from. By the way, just if you want to know the technical term, the alternating pattern of constructive, destructive, constructive, destructive interference that makes light, dark, light, dark patterns when a wave uh, has this uh, diffraction interference effect are called fringes. We already know, of course, that having two slits transmitting the light 
uh, caused a nice uniformly spaced set of fringes there. We know the formula for it. M lambda equals D sine theta. Now, in this case, as I said, there's only one slit, but we're going to look at it more carefully. Actually, according to Huygens' principle, you could break down the light that passes through the slit into a large number, maybe an infinite number of little vertical rows of waves that are passing through here. They can actually interfere with each other. Yes, that's what I'm saying. The light, for example, that goes through the top of that slit and then the light that goes through the bottom of that slit, as they go up at an angle here to the screen, will have the possibility of becoming out of phase. They have the possibility of becoming a half a wavelength out of phase and destructively interfering with each other. I'll show you a slide that shows that a little bit better now. Let's look at these different arrows here. First case is very simple and trivial. If the wave is going straight on through, then all of the waves at the, now I'm looking at the slit uh, sideways, there's the top of the slit, there's the bottom of the slit. The waves at the top of the slit, if it's going straight through, and the waves at the bottom of the slit, if it's going straight through, will have the same path length, and therefore they'll be exactly in phase when they land up, say, over here at the other side where the screen is projected onto. So they constructively add together and you'll have a bright, very bright region. So that's trivial, duh. They all go through together. The tricky part comes when the wave might be coming at a little bit of an angle. What kind of angle? Well, let's look at this fairly carefully here. Although I'm not expecting you to be able to reproduce this derivation, I want you to see what it happens. Let's suppose that we have a small angle theta here, which is just big enough so that if you take a ray that's going right through the middle of the slit here and compare that with a ray that's going at the bottom or at the top, they are exactly different in path length by half a wavelength. You can see that this extra path length here that the middle ray has to travel compared to this lower ray is half a wavelength and also, not coincidentally, this middle ray here has a half a wavelength less of path length than the top ray here. The top ray has to go an extra lambda just to catch up with the wave front at the bottom of the slit. So what's the result of that? Each little segment here at the bottom of the slit has a core see that's that segment there that's the, the the bottom segment of light has a corresponding equal amount of light up here which has one half wavelength longer path to go than this segment did what about the second segment here I could break this up into a lot of segments here it's just six this second segment here is exactly half a wavelength ahead of this segment up here. And this top segment here, this last one, is half a wavelength behind this segment here. In other words, what I'm saying is the bottom half of the slit is half a wavelength ahead of the top half of the slit. And you know what a half a wavelength does. That's 180 degrees out of phase. It's going to cause cancellation, destructive interference. The top half of the slit canceling out and destructively interfering with the waves from the bottom half of the slit, but only for a precise condition. Now, this is going to look fairly similar. You remember your triangles here. This path length has to be, at halfway through the slit here, has to be exactly half a wavelength. So the formula for destructive interference, then, is basically a over 2 sine theta equals lambda over 2, or any multiple of lambda over 2. So just writing that fairly simply, we get this formula. This should look similar, except the difference now is A is the width of the slit itself, not the separation between two slits. That was the formula we had for the double slit 
experiment. Now the slit is interfering with itself. Top half and the bottom half are interfering with each other. And by the way, this doesn't just require uh, MB1, which is the case here. M could be 2 or 3, and you can still have the same condition. It just gets a little more complicated. Uh, in this case, we have the different pieces of the slit interfering with smaller pieces. This was a very simple case where the top half of the slit interfered and canceled the bottom half of the slit. Now you can have uh, the top quarter of the slit interfering with the second quarter of the slit and the third quarter interfering with the fourth quarter. Anyway, those are more complicated cases. So we're not just going to see one destructive interference cancellation. There'll be a whole series of minima here given by this formula, intensity minima. Now, I don't have a simple formula for it, but you can pretty well imagine that the brightest regions where there's the most constructive uh, interference with the, of the light rays, in other words, where the light is brightest, should be somewhere in between these values. So, um, as, as we saw before, not exactly, but, but close enough. So, without doing any math, uh, that's the interference of light passing through a single slit with itself. And you can see actually in this illustration that the reason that this rather unexpected phenomenon happens, it's a pure wave phenomenon, happens only, as I said, when the slit width itself, right, this is, this is how tall the slit is, A here, when A is not too much larger than the wavelength of light. That's, see, there's the wavelength of light there, and you can see that that's actually not that much smaller than A. Then you're going to notice these weird uh, interference cancellation effects. If, if, again, as I said, if you have a monochromatic light, single light source uh, that starts all the light out at, uh, in phase, then you'll see, notice this effect. So that works really well, for example, when I have a laser in class to illustrate this. You can definitely get these effects. Well, how much bigger or smaller than the slit does the wavelength have to be? I've got three different cases illustrated here. And the first one, is, well, let's look at the middle one here first. The middle one is very much like the illustration I just had on the previous slide. We have a slit which is about five wavelengths wide. Forget about how long it is. I don't care about that. That's just let more light through so we can see the pattern. The question is how wide or narrow is the slit? In this case, it's five wavelengths wide. And sure enough, as advertised, you get a minimum of, this is because of destructive interference, cancellation there. And then there's another cancellation about twice as far out and, and so on. Just with that formula, that we had before. It's almost exactly with that formula. Um, actually, there's a little factor of 1.2 in here, if we want to do this exactly correctly. And now what happens if, for example, I were to make the slit wider? This is where things get interesting. So now, on the right example here, I'm going to show you the pattern that would be projected onto the screen from the interference sort of, uh, pattern, the fringes, when the slit is eight wavelengths across. We're opening up the slit, making it wider. Remember the formula? A sine theta equals m lambda. So what have I done? This should remind you of the question we asked in class with the double slit experiment. The double slit experiment, I said, what happens if you spread the slits out more? The pattern actually got smaller in angle because sine theta got smaller and so theta got smaller. That's exactly what's happening here when I make A. It's just the same mathematics. When I make A larger, then the angles get smaller here. So see now, that's the first minimum. That's the first dark band. There's the second dark band. They're closer together. It looks like it's about 7 degrees, 8 degrees there, 16 degrees there, and so on. What's the opposite situation? Opposite situation is if I make the slit so small, well, this is extremely small, where the slit height here, or width, 
the slit is only one wavelength of light in size. That is almost like having a point of light and it just diffracts out almost spherically, almost uniformly in all directions because that's Huygens' principle. Remember, if you break light down, if you narrow it down in space so finely that it's just like a point here, you try to narrow it down to less than a wavelength, it splashes out and diffracts out in all directions. You don't even see any clear minima. There's just a very broad maximum there. Now, here's what I want you to notice, because it might be a little bit counterintuitive. I can't tell you how many students, maybe even me on occasion, got this backwards. It's the uncertainty principle I mentioned in class. The, what we're trying to do, basically, or what the slit is trying to do is, as you narrow the width of the slit and you decrease A, you are trying to confine the location of the wave which is a difficult thing to do because a wave is not necessarily just a purely localized phenomenon at one point. But you're trying to do that. You're saying, well, the wave came in maybe as a big parallel wavefront that spread out all over the place. But by the time it hit my slit, I'm going to say definitely that it was going right through the slit. So I know exactly where it is in space. And as I make the slit smaller, I'm trying to define more precisely, I'm trying to decrease the uncertainty in the location or the position of the wave. You can do that. You can do that if you want. You can open up the slit. Uh, sorry, you can make the slit even. This is a bigger slit. You can make it smaller. You can make it really small. But what do you lose knowledge of? Look at this. You can't tell which direction the wave is going when it, after you've confined it in position in space, you can't tell what direction it's going anymore. You couldn't have your cake and eat it too. Before you had any slit, we knew exactly which way the wave was going. It was going exactly along the x-axis. It was going perfectly horizontally. That, there was almost no uncertainty in the direction. But we had a great deal of uncertainty in saying where the wave was. It was all up and down that wave front. Now, what you tried to do by making the slit small and small is you tried to say, well, I want to narrow down the location or position of this wave. And the result is that the uncertainty in its direction increased. So you can either measure one very accurately where the wave is, or you can measure the other one, the direction, very accurately, but you cannot measure both of them accurately. In fact, there's a fundamental limit to the product of the uncertainty of the position, the uncertainty of the direction. Uh, you multiply those two uncertainties together, and it always has to be bigger than 2 pi. But you don't need to know that formula. That is the uncertainty principle described in mathematics. But you can kind of see it right here. Here we had a rather big slit, so we did not localize the light very much in position. But I'm happy to say, you can see here, it was possible to say fairly close within, what is this, about uh, 6 or 7 or 10 degrees, you could say what direction it was coming out when it emerged from that slit. Here I got a little more greedy. I said I want to narrow down the location of that wavefront down to only five wavelengths. By pushing that slit narrower, I made the direction more uncertain, right? This blew up. And then this is an extreme case. I localized the position of the wave very accurately, the direction became almost indeterminate. That's the uncertainty principle. It applies to all waves. Now, does this diffraction effect that we've seen here go over to the more familiar case in a limit? Yes, it does. You can see where we're going with this. As you make the slit bigger and bigger and bigger, you stop trying to really localize where the wave is. Let many wavelengths through many more than eight wavelengths through, you can see what's going to happen. According to the formula, this peak in the direction of the wave is going to be confined to a smaller and smaller angle until eventually, if you're letting uh, hundreds of wavelengths through, in other words, if you have a slit which is much bigger than the wavelength of light, you'll know exactly what direction the light is coming through the slit and projecting onto the screen uh, on the other side of the slit. In other words, it's just as if there almost wasn't a slit 
there at all. The light just keeps on marching forward in the same direction it was if you have a very, very large obstacle. The diffraction effect, as you can see from this, is serious when the obstacles and the apertures and the boundaries and so on are comparable to, not that different, from the wavelength of the wave that's coming through. Where are these minima? That's really the only, in fact, in particular, the most important question I'm going to ask you on the exam is where is this first minimum? How many degrees away from straight on is it? In other words, how much uncertainty is there in the direction or the location of the waves or the light source? For example, if I'm using a telescope or a microscope, I want to know exactly where, what direction that light came from. And you can see the uncertainty principle here, it's called the diffraction limit, sets a limit of how many degrees I can distinguish between. For example, if I had two light sources which are separated by an angle, I'm using a small angle approximation here, if I had two, the approximate formula is just the wavelength divided by the width of the slit or the aperture that the light is squeezed through, lambda over A. If you go through a bunch of calculus, which is a little more advanced, you find out it's not exactly one. There's a coefficient of 1.2 there. But I'm not going to even really care if you got the 1.2 correct or not. Uh, if you just said that the angular width that's going from 0 from one side to the other here, so that's the half width, is lambda over a, I'll give you full credit for that. Exact value is 1.2 lambda over a. So let's see, for example, if I had two light sources which were giving off waves of a certain wavelength lambda, and they were less than this angle apart from each other, as seen by us, you couldn't tell that there were two light sources. The diffraction limit would blur those two images of those two different lights together, and it would look basically like one maybe sort of slightly elongated light source. So this is a very important formula because it tells you how much magnification any system can have that's using light to make images. Pretty important because, you know, we always want the highest resolution images on the finest scales to look at the smallest angles. Well, I don't care how much money you spend on it. I don't care how fancy your optics are. They will never, ever beat the uncertainty principle. They will never beat this formula, even with perfect optics. Kind of bugs you, doesn't it? Bugs me. And uh, this is true, like I said, particularly for telescopes and microscopes. There's just a limit. Even if you were, for example, to take out all other sources that tend to blur the light and move it around in angle and uh, splash it around, even if you were to eliminate all of that, the fundamental wave nature of whatever you're looking at itself will cause diffraction. By the way, that is the reason if you want to get a very, very accurate image or picture of an object, you want to have the smallest possible scales, the smallest angles resolved so that they don't blur together, what wavelength would you want to use? I want theta here to be very small. If I want super high magnification, what would I use? A very short wavelength. So if I were using visible light, I would want to do it in the blue or the violet, but I might not stop there. Biological people want to see incredibly small angles. They don't necessarily just stop with blue light or ultraviolet light. The finest pictures that you can take of things on the small scales use the shortest wavelengths that we can control, x-rays. X-rays have very short wavelength. That's how you can see really small angles and get incredibly high magnification. Of course, the X-rays do tend to destroy what you're looking at. Well, this is dead already. Let's do an application of this fundamental uncertainty principle to sound waves. Let's see. Here are two speakers that you might find in a concert hall. And so they're really the same kind of horn speaker. The only difference here, and these are a few feet in size, the only difference is that one of them has been uh, put vertically on a stand like this. The other one is horizontally on a stand like this. First of all, let's deal with the question one immediately. 
do we have to worry about diffraction here or could we just to treat all of the sound waves coming out of this speaker as just straight rays and forget Huygens and forget everything uh, don't bother about diffraction we've been talking about in this chapter chapter 34 well actually the wavelength of sound waves like a, a middle C is surprisingly long basically that's because the speed of sound isn't that high compared to the speed of light so the way the sounds that are probably going to come out of this speaker are going to be in the wavelength range of a, of a foot or two feet. So yes, it's going to make a big difference. The, the diffraction limit will be crucial in deciding what the sound pattern is that's put out by the waves of the speaker, right? The, the waves in this speaker are very well... Con there, there's a very small width in this direction, right? That corresponds to a very small value of A. In this direction, A is very large. So if you were to just, all you have to know is the diffraction limit that we just had in the previous slide. If you want to look at the sound pattern that comes out of one of these rectangular horn speakers, it's going to be very different in the horizontal direction from in the vertical direction. This is designed this way, actually. These speakers are supposed to do that. In one direction, the waves are going to be very well confined in direction. In the other dimension, the waves are going to splash out at all angles. Which is it? Let's, for example, suppose that we're in an auditorium, maybe a church, for example. That's a nice thought. All of the people in the church are pretty much have their ears at about head level or seat level or whatever. So suppose that you're playing an organ in there, some Bach, I, I tend to prefer there. Um, and then these magnificent uh, notes of Bach, uh, I want them all to come to our ears here in the congregation. I don't want speakers that are going to blast a lot of sound waves up into the rafters of the church or, or down on the floor. That's dumb. So I want the direction to be pretty well horizontally confined to a fairly narrow range so most of the energy and power will be heard by the congregation's heads. But the congregation, of course, is sitting at all different angles. They're not just in front of the speaker. So some of them are off 45 degrees to the left or to the right. So I want the sound to wash out and spread around horizontally a great deal. So I want the sound to be confined to a band like this. Vertically, very confined direction. Horizontally, unconfined direction. Which speaker, or the same speaker here, which way do I mount it? And if you're like so many students who did this before, since you don't intuitively think in Fourier transform space, and you don't intuitively think about the perverseness, I guess, of the diffraction limit, you might have picked this speaker here. I wouldn't blame you if you did, because doesn't it look like the waves are going to splash out horizontally like this? Whereas it looks like the waves are confined vertically rather tightly. But that is the slit. That's not the projected pattern of the waves after they pass through this rectangular slit. It's the opposite of that. Remember, if I want to confine the direction of the waves, and sorry, if I want to define the direction of the waves very accurately, I have to open up the slit very wide. Remember, that's the perverseness of the uncertainty principle. Maybe it's, you're getting a little more intuitive. So if I want to confine all the waves to a narrow horizontal band, I need the horn speaker mounted vertically like this. This is, this is why you have to spend extra money to make it so tall like this, so that it will focus, keep the waves, the sound waves, focused in a narrow horizontal band. Whereas, I didn't have to spend much money on this, the waves are going to splash out horizontally in all different directions because here, A, A in this direction is small.
got that? And the frequency obviously does matter. It's those longest wavelength notes when the organ hits the bass and it's powerful and it stirs your soul. Those waves are going to get all uh, diffract, all spread out enormously um, with a very, very high uh, little notes. You won't, it's not going to make that much difference. Um, what, what the shape of the speaker is. The diffraction effects will be strongest for the lowest frequencies because they're the longest wavelengths. Now, I'm going to go a little further with this. There's no more mathematics and there probably are not really any workable homework problems or exam problems here. I just want to show you diffraction is just all over the place. And that means interference between waves can just happen in all kinds of situations, not just one slit, a rectangle slit, or a pair of slits, or a whole series of equally spaced slits. Anytime, anytime you try to block or confine where a wave front is moving, you get diffraction and you can get interference phenomenon if you have a single light source of monochromatic light. So I've got a picture of a ordinary household razor blade here. But the picture was taken specially. I mean, they don't look like that if you normally look at it, because normally you're looking at all different wavelengths in white light, blue light, green light, all different wavelengths simultaneously, and it's usually not illuminated by just a single source of light so that everything can stay in phase. But if you do illuminate it that way, for example, maybe with a laser beam, look at this. Your eyes are not deceiving you here. There's no mistake in the photographic film or the processing and printing of this image here. It looks like there's a series of lines around the edge of this razor blade. And if you look carefully, there's even more than one line here. Oh my gosh, there's an alternating series of dark and light bands at the edge of this razor. That's not real, is it? I mean, the razor blade stops here, but not the light that tries to bend around it. The light that bends around it actually can interfere constructively or destructively, constructively and destructively, if it's just a small number of wavelengths away from the edge of the razor blade. How amazing is that? Another interference pattern happening right in your you know, household bathroom here if you turn off all the lights, except maybe if you just shave with a laser, you would notice this effect. Pretty amazing, huh? The wave nature of light. All right, here's, here's the money one, though, that you do need to know. Let's get back to the single slit. That was all of those problems that I was uh, talking about earlier of the single slit is basically a one-dimensional problem. I just have a bunch of plane waves come in and I move one dimension of the slit up or down. I change A, or in now, a, yeah, now we're going to call it capital D. I, change, I open the slit up, I close the slit down. That was a one-dimensional diffraction pattern. What about a two-dimensional diffraction pattern? Well, how would that work out? Mathematically, it's a little more messy and complicated. We're not going to do the mathematics. Just imagine, for example, that I had a little rectangular slit and then I just rotate it around at a whole different series of angles. A whole, there's a little pun there. Then, if I rotate it around enough, I've made, in two dimensions, a circular aperture, a round hole. What would the diffraction pattern of light waves going through a round hole look like? Now, I guess for just nomenclature purposes, instead of calling this dimension of this hole A, which is what I was calling it in the one-dimensional case, I'm going to call this D here. Well, the same phenomenon apply, the same formula applies, except now it's going to be in all directions. This D is very symmetric, so I think I'm expecting to see a interference diffraction pattern projected on the screen behind the hole should also be very highly symmetric. It's got to be some combination of circles. Well, it's exactly the same thing that we saw before. The light that passed right down the middle, come, coming straight, straight on through the hole there, all arrived in the middle here in phase, constructively adds together, makes a bright circle. That's nice. But what's going on over here at an angle theta 1, right, some of the light rays on one side 
of this aperture destructively interfered with light rays on the other side of the aperture and caused them to cancel out. There's a minimum here, basically a dark ring here. Oh, but then there's another maximum over here and another minimum and another maxima. So there's a series of circles of ever-growing radius where there are minima. There, there, there. What do you think is the formula for theta? Theta 1 is the first minimum. That's the one I'm most concerned with here. It is telling us how tightly a circle, suppose this was an optic or a lens or something, how tightly can this optic define what direction the light is coming after it has gone through the optic. In other words, what's the maximum magnification possible from a perfect round optic of diameter D? Well, the answer you might not be surprised to know is what? The, the angle here, the maximum magnification you get is 1.2 lambda over d. The same formula as before that we had in one dimension. Now I've just turned it around into two dimensions, rotated it around. And so let's finish up with a very important example that's near and dear to all of our hearts. What is the maximum magnification resolving power of a human eye, even if it's a perfect eye? And I don't mind telling you, the human eye, through millions of years of evolution, is pretty darn close to being optically perfect, um, you know, at least when you have 20-20 vision and so on, and, but it can't give you infinite magnification just because of the nature of light. The wave nature of light and the diffraction limit means, let's suppose your eye when it's dilated here um, is about a half a centimeter aperture wide. Well, that's a fairly small value of D. There's not an infinite number of wavelengths of light passing through the top and the bottom of your eye. So I think diffraction is going to be an important issue here. Let's take an actual formula. Here's your formula. I want you to memorize this. The diffraction limit of any wave of wavelength lambda passing through a circular aperture D. In this case, D is a half a centimeter. Let's take visible light. Yeah, this looks like... Um, Actually, that's green light there. 5 times 10 to the more minus 4 centimeters. Pretty small wavelength. So you're thinking, well, my eye is huge compared to the wavelength of light, so I guess it's going to give me a pretty small theta. That's right, it does. What does it work out to? Theta, this formula is in radians. Remember that on your calculator. It's not in degrees. If lambda and d, they're both the distances, they need to be in the same units. So let's see, I'll put lambda the wavelength of light in centimeters. I'll put the size of the eye in centimeters. Then I get, let's see, 5 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by 5 times 10 to the minus 1. The 5's cancel. I have just the order of magnitude here. Keep fact the powers of 10 correct. 10 to the minus 3 radians. Well, let's see, a thousandth of a radian is a thousandth of about 58 degrees. It's several minutes of arc. That's a small angle. Way to go, human eyes. You can, under good conditions, resolve two light sources that are only separated by an angle that's much less than one degree. If something is one degree in size, you can clearly resolve it and see what its structure is. So, for example, suppose that I have two light sources here. So this could be two ends of an object. Then looking at something which is about 10 centimeters in size here. How far away can that be? And your eye could still tell one end from the other end, could still resolve it under good conditions, assuming you have good vision here. 10 to the minus 3 radians, that's your angle. For a small angle here, that's a very small angle. That's the ratio of y over s in this long skinny triangle. It's because sine theta is approximately theta. Remember that uh, very popular approximation. So y over s is approximately equal to 10 to the minus 3. What is y? In our example, it's 10 centimeters. I want to know what s is. Remember, I always give you two of the things. You figure out the third one here. 10 to the minus 3 equals 10 divided by 10,000. 10 to the 4. So your eye can just 
distinguish between two objects separated by only a few inches at a distance of 10,000 centimeters or 100 meters, the length of a football field. That's right. Under good conditions, then, for example, suppose that this was that you have put the two lights uh, on uh, the top and bottom of a baseball. You could, under good conditions, and you, you just walk onto a field. You don't even know what sport it is, what you're playing. But you got to pick it up uh, quickly, figure it out so you don't look dumb, you don't look uh, uncool. Your eye can look all the way across the length of a football field and see if that's a soccer ball or a baseball. Well, okay, if you're on a football field, you probably already know you're not going to be playing baseball. But anyway, that's how good a human eye is. It works almost at the diffraction limit of perfect optics. As I said, an enormous amount of evolutionary perfection has made this work very well. Owls, I believe, have bigger eyes so that they can resolve even smaller things at large distances, like a little mouse that's scurrying around uh, in the field. They have amazing eyes. But uh, ours are pretty darn good for their size. And if you want to see a higher magnification than uh, recognizing a baseball uh, at a distance of 100 meters, I'm sorry, you would need to have a bigger eyeball, and there's just not room in your head for that. But given the size that you have, half a centimeter, the eye works amazingly well.